want you to give a great Dallas, Texas, and around the world welcome to Pastor Troy and Larry Elder. Would you give them a good hand? Come on, come on. Larry, sit in the middle here. It is an honor to have you with us here in Dallas, Texas. Tell, tell us before we get into some questions, tell us what is the most important thing that's coming up, Larry, in this next presidential election. First of all, thank you so much for having me. And uh, Pastor Larry, Pastor Troy, I want to apologize for how casually I'm dressed. Here's the deal. Pastor Troy said, we're going to pick you up, we're going to take a little tour, take it, have a dinner, you'll be able to take a nap, put your suit and tie on, <laughs> to go to a restaurant, order a steak bigger than Texas. <laughs> I ate maybe half of it, and then he goes, oh my God, we have 15 minutes to get to the church. <laughs> so that explains the shoes and the lack of tie and everything, so I apologize for that. But I blame it on him. <laughs> But to answer your question, politicians always say this, and I was one briefly. This is the most important election of our lifetime. This really is. Yes. You know, Trump has said things like, we won't have a country if we have another four years of Biden. We won't have a country. Eight million people in the country here illegally. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. Hundreds on the terror watch list. Another 9-11 is only a moment away. I believe the only reason we have not had another 9-11 because the terrorists know that if somebody pulls something like that, and if they connect the dots between that and somebody Joe Biden allowed to come in, Donald Trump wins in a landslide. So they're going to hold back until the election. We've got uh, runaway uh, inflation, 40-year high. Gas prices are 50% higher than they were before uh, 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 Trump, uh, after Biden got in. And then, of course, you have crime. You have this hostility uh, against the police, this war on the police, uh, after the death of George Floyd, however you feel about the death of George Floyd, let me just say this. There is zero evidence that what the officer did had anything to do with George Floyd's race. Zero evidence. Wow. In fact, the lead prosecutor uh, and Pastor Larry, the trial was on television. The lead prosecutor was a black man. And I'm a lawyer. I was a trial lawyer when I practiced. And the most important part of a trial is the opening statement. And in the opening statement, this black prosecutor took pains to say, the police in general are not on trial. The Minneapolis PD is not on trial. This individual is on trial for this individual did or didn't do to George Floyd. And he was never charged with a hate crime. Wow. Yet we had four months of protests in the streets, all because of an assumption false that what happened to George Floyd had to do with his race when there's zero evidence of it. Uh, I'll give you an idea of how corrupted the minds are of people because of this nonsense about systemic racism. There's a website called policemag.com. Right. And uh, a few years ago, they asked people who self-described as very liberal. And I suspect most of the people that were in the streets, by the way, there were 25 people who were killed, 2,000 officers were injured, at least $2 billion in insured property damage, maybe another billion or two in uninsured property damage, all because of an assumption that what happened to George Floyd had to do with their race. Most of the people out there would probably self-describe as very liberal. So they asked people who self-described as very liberal, in 2019, how many unarmed black men did the police kill? 50% of the self-described very liberal people thought the police killed 1,000. 8% thought they killed 10,000. What you ask, did the just regular liberal people think? 39% of them thought the police killed 1,000. 5% thought they killed 10,000. The answer, according to the Washington Post database, 12. Wow. 12. Wow. In fact, they kill more unarmed whites every year than they kill unarmed blacks. But this is what people thought. And that's how corrupted things are because of this war against the police, this lie that America remains systemically racist. So these are all the things that are right, that are on stake uh, on, on November the 5th. And it's not just November the 5th now. Remember, uh, depending upon the, the state you live in, it could be voting month. And one of the reasons we've gotten killed tactically is that we don't like anything other than same day voting. I believe you should show up, paper ballot, yeah. ID, yeah. obviously. Yeah, 
But that's not the way it is in a lot of states. We have to play by the cards that we're dealt. And so we need to get into the game of early voting as well. And I think Donald Trump recognizes that. Yeah. So that's what's at stake. Yeah. You know, a um, couple weeks ago, I was at the Capitol. And after I spoke, I had dinner with Senator Ted Cruz. And I asked him a question. I want to ask you this. Looking at all the different policies that the Democrats are bringing to America, what do you feel is the Democrats' end game? What, what are they going for? I, it's obvious they are ruining our country. What's their end game? It's not, uh, you don't have to be Columbo to put that together. Their end game is power and whatever they can do to take over. Uh, it is obvious they have allowed 8 million people in the country. Some, by one estimate, 2.7 million are going to figure out some sort of way of voting. Right. They haven't won the white vote since 1964. They win by convincing black people and other people of color that you're victims. And by the way, in this struggle, we're the good guys. And these dastardly Republicans over there, they're the bad guys. So they're importing new voters. There's no question about that. Uh, Chuck Schumer wrote a paper uh, when he was in college. Or he was teaching at a, at, a, at a university. And he argued in the newspaper, in, in his paper, that non-citizens should be allowed to vote. So that's what they want. What year was this? 1993, he wrote this. Wow. And he still feels that same way. They want non-citizens to vote. And if they can't vote by cheating, they want them to vote legally by allowing non-citizens to vote. That is their agenda. There's a guy named Elisio Medina. He is the senior VP treasurer of the largest union in the country, the SEIU Union, Service Employees International Union. 2009, after Obama got elected, he gave a speech. And he said, if we can get 11 million illegal aliens turn citizens turn voters, two-thirds of them will vote for our agenda, and we will have, quote, a governing coalition for the long haul, wow. close quote. He said it publicly. Wow. It's not like they're, they're lying about it. Wow. That's what they want. Wow. That's why they want amnesty. Believe me, if, if illegal aliens turn legal residents, turn voters, would vote Republican, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Right, <laughs> right. The, the borders would be shut down tighter than the clans behind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know how tight that is, sir. <laughs> I know, you're, I know you're, you're smelling what I'm cooking. Yeah. Be, before we ask you another question, or Troy, you ask a question, I want Troy to uh, explain your T-shirt. <laughs> Show everybody your T-shirt. I didn't think you were going to really put me on the spot like that. <laughs> Read what it says for the because people watching by camera. Founder of the Texas Non-Black Club. So I had this shirt made when Joe Biden made his comment that if you have to decide whether you're for me or Trump, and uh, you ain't black. And so I, I, I had this shirt made um, for that as a proud founding member of the Texas Non-Black Club. <laughs> you, you know, Larry, uh, Sonny Hostins, one of the panelists on The View, she said there's no such thing as black Republicans. Those are unicorns. So I posted on my Twitter file a picture of a lot of black people wearing Trump hats, and I said, unicorns for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I think a question that um, I have and a lot of people have is in this next election, and I agree a thousand percent, sir, that uh, this is the most important election in the history of our country. Is, is there a way to keep when you ran for governor, in my opinion, you won, and it was stolen from you. Yeah. In my opinion, it was, it was stolen. It was. Right? H how do we keep them from stealing this next election? Well, the good news is we're on to them this time. Uh, a whole bunch of Republican governors, Republican AGs now have put into laws in at least those states where it's harder to cheat, harder to bend the rules, uh, so that we're not going to have a repeat of 2020. I also believe that because things are so bad, I've never seen poll numbers this low for an incumbent president at this time. Biden is sitting at 37 points. That's lower than anything I've ever seen in my life. When people are paying $1,200 a month for the same goods and services as they bought three and a half years ago, there's almost nothing else to say. Yeah. When you're paying 50% more for gas prices, there's almost nothing else to say. The general line is, are you better off now or are you better off then? And I don't know anybody other than illegal aliens who can say they're better off now. Right. <laughs> so how do we so, keep so, them? So it's, my, so it's my long way of answering, Larry, that 
I believe it's not going to be close. There are states now that are in play, like Virginia, that otherwise were not, were not, are not going to be in play. I think it's going to be a bigger uh, win than I think we think. I think a lot of black people are waking up. I'm seeing polls showing at least as many as 20% or 30% of black people are now considering voting for Donald Trump. That is, that is that's a seismic shift. Yeah. And young people as well. And Hispanics, he's now underwater with the Hispanic vote. Surprise, surprise, Hispanics don't want open borders either. And the people that are most hurt by open borders are black and brown people living in the inner city with high school or less education because virtually all the illegal aliens have little or no education. And there was a study done by the Civil Rights Commission a few years ago, and it found out that there are about a million fewer black men working than would otherwise be the case but for the presence of illegal alien labor. And that was before 8 million illegal wow. aliens came in. Wow. And the illegal alien labor, according to the study, puts downward pressure to the tune of $1,800 on the salaries of black and brown people living in the inner city, and they know this. Wow. So for all those reasons, I don't believe it's going to be close. But um, in 2020, lots of shenanigans took place that won't take place again this time. Most notably, the 51 people that signed that letter claiming that the Hunter Biden laptop story had all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. That's not going to happen this time. Mark Zuckerberg spent $419.5 million of his own money on election officials in Democratic areas to get out the turnout. That's not going to happen again. Wow. Uh, we don't have the Russia uh, collusion BS this time. That's been, that's been uh, refuted. So there are lots of things that happened in 2020 that will not happen now. There are th we, Donald Trump lost that election, if he lost it, by no more than 30 or 40,000 votes in three states. Let me just give you three of them. Right. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania used COVID as an excuse to change all sorts of rules and regulations, including boring things like signature matching. There are two left-wing lawyers, Alan Dershowitz and a guy named Jonathan Turley. Trump quotes them a lot. They, they did not vote for Trump. Yeah. They wouldn't vote for him if you paid them, but they're honest. And they thought at the time when Donald Trump filed the lawsuit against Pennsylvania, that A, the Supreme Court would take it up, and B, that the Supreme Court would rule in favor of Trump. Neither of which happened, but the point is, it was that close. Michigan, uh, the Secretary of State used COVID as an excuse to send in mail-in ballot applications to every registered voter, whether that voter requested one or not. Uh, Donald Trump filed a lawsuit, he lost it two to one, and there was a judge that filed a dissent and said what the Secretary of State did was unlawful. He almost won that lawsuit. Wisconsin. That went all the way up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Donald Trump lost it four to three on procedural grounds. But the Chief Justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court filed a dissent and said, we did all sorts of things that were unlawful, including having unsecured ballot uh, drop-off places and something called democracy in the park, where people went and registered people as they were sitting in a park uh, unlawfully. Neither of those things are going to be going forward in Wisconsin. They ruled them unconstitutional after the the, the, the uh, election was over, but going forward, they're not doing them anymore. So there are lots of things that happen in 2020 that will not happen again. And finally, we wow. don't have COVID. You take away COVID, Donald Trump wins. Yeah. 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 You know, Troy, I'll, I'll open up for you to ask something, but I, I know all you know this, but this gentleman is a brilliant, brilliant man. And he would and, have and, been. And, a, and, and sex symbol. <laughs> Sex symbol. Don't, don't leave that out. And he would have been a, 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 an excellent governor, and he would, would, will someday be an excellent leader, I believe, again, in, uh, in Washington. I believe God has a tremendous future, and, and we need to listen to what he has to say. Um, I want to ask about foreign policy here in a second. If you have, do you have something you want to ask first? Okay, I'm going to be, uh, I leave Friday for Israel. I'm going to be speaking to, I'm going to be with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I'm going to be with 150 Jewish financial political leaders from around the world. And uh, just today, I believe it was, that Prime Minister Netanyahu made a statement about America not giving the arms to Israel to fight. And, and I think most Americans understand Hamas and Hezbollah are not just Israel's enemies. They are our enemies. They're the world's enemies. And that they are funded by Iran. Everyone knows that. 95% of the funds that go to Hamas, 95, 98% that go to Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is getting ready. And Hezbollah is much more sophisticated in their ability to fight Israel. And now America has 
canceled their meeting with Netanyahu. They said they're not going to meet with him. When President Trump put the sanctions on Iran, it, we were that close to the Ayatollah being thrown out because Iran was being bankrupt. Why would the, the Biden administration release the funds, remove the sanctions to a country that's not only supporting terrorism against Israel and around the world, but is shouting death to America? De on October 8th, in the parliament of Iran, they weren't shouting death to Israel, they were shouting death to America. Why doesn't America, why doesn't this present administration stand with Israel right now? Sometimes, Larry, the simplest answer is the most accurate. Stupidity. Yeah. Absolute, <laughs> complete. Good night, stupidity. everybody. <laughs> and I will say that a substantial percentage of the Democratic Party is anti-Semitic. You've got the, the squad, people like Ilan Omar and uh, uh, Presley and, and Tlaib. They are simply anti-Semitic. Uh, I believe that the Obama administration was very hostile to Israel. Uh, one official in the Obama administration referred to Bibi Netanyahu as chicken bleep. And it, and it got public. And it got public because Obama wanted it to become public. There's been tremendous hostility towards Israel because of a f false belief that the poor Palestinians have been subordinated by the Israelis. The Israelis are essentially running an apartheid state uh, and that they only kind of became there because of World War II, as opposed to having a 3,000 year connection to the land. There's never been a country called Palestine. There's never been a ruler that ruled Palestine. Exactly. It's all BS, but, but exactly. because American kids are so ill-informed, they yeah. really believe that uh, Israel just kind of came in there after, after World War II. And why should the poor Palestinians suffer because of what happened uh, in Europe? That's what they believe. Uh, I just saw a film that Obama and Michelle produced called Rustin. Have you seen it? Anybody seen it? Yeah. About Bayard Rustin? Bayard Rustin was a civil rights activist. Uh, he was a lieutenant of uh, MLK. And he is the architect behind the March on Washington that culminated into the 1963 I Have a Dream speech. It was Bayard Rustin's brainchild to put all this together. And this movie was about him. Uh, he's openly gay um, and uh, talked about how that kind of compromised what he was trying to do. It was really an interesting movie. What's, what's more interesting to me is that the movie did not at all talk about Bayard Rustin's beliefs as they would impact the Democratic Party today. He died in 1987, I think it was. The Democratic Party is all about DEI, affirmative action, underrepresentation, hostility to Israel. Even though he was black and gay, he opposed race-based preferences. Mm. Uh, he said the fact that a business has underrepresentation does not in and of itself mean discrimination. Regarding reparations, he called reparations preposterous, his word, not mine. And he said, my great-grandfather may have picked cotton, and maybe somebody owed something to him, but nobody owes me anything. And he was a Zionist, wow. a staunch advocate of, of, uh, of Israel. He condemned uh, black anti-Semitism, which is a real problem. Yeah. Uh, black an anti-Semitism in the black community is about three times higher than the rate of anti-Semitism in the non-black Gentile community. Uh, and he chastised blacks for their anti-Semitism. So if you look at issue by issue by issue, he's on the opposite side of Obama, even though Obama and Michelle produced this movie. And I just wrote a column about it, and at the end of the column I said, I want to see you guys do that movie. Mm. So Israel is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, the existential threat to America is not just China. It's radical Islam. Uh, and um, the number one sponsor of terror in the world is Iran. And sooner or later, Iran needs to be dealt with. Yeah. And the Obama administration was giving them a pathway to getting a nuclear bomb. Can you imagine a yeah. world where the Ayatollahs have a nuclear bomb? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, we, what, we're, that's what we're up against. We, uh, you know, obviously, I've, this will be my 45th trip to Israel. And I, I, we do a lot with the country of Israel, with the government of Israel. And um, a thing that Israel is concerned about now is by America pulling away from supporting them. What is this saying to Iran? What's this saying to Russia? Putin just met with uh, the leaders of North Korea and signed a pact. What's this saying to China? What's this saying to Syria? 
is this opening a door for the enemies of Israel, but also who are the enemies of, of America? What is this saying to leaders around the world? It's saying to leaders around the world that our friends can't trust us and our enemies need not fear us. Right. Pulling out of Afghanistan the way he did, not only did he pull out of Afghanistan and not tell the allies he was doing it, not only did he leave seven or eight billion dollars in military equipment that's being used against us yeah. right now, not only did that lead to 13 servicemen uh, and women being killed, not only did it lead to hundreds of Afghan collaborators and Americas left behind uh, in Afghanistan, he also threw our military under the bus by saying, nobody told me that the Afghan government would dissolve and the Taliban would come back in a matter of weeks. Two high-ranking generals testified under oath, that's exactly what we mm. told the commander-in-chief. Mm. Now, if you're a friend or an enemy of America and you're watching the president say that the military never told him this would happen, Either our military is incompetent or the president is lying. Either way, it doesn't really give you a great deal of confidence if you're a friend. Right. And it gives you a great deal of courage if you're an enemy. Mm. Uh, this man has, I, I can't think of a single thing he's done that I approve of. He's undermined the country every which way he could. And four more years of Donald Trump could be, frankly, they talk about democracy on the ballot, democracy on the ballot. A, we don't have a democracy, we have a republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And B, if it's on the ballot, it's because of you. Uh, I think it was Alexander Hamilton, correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, I know you will. Um, <laughs> he said, a democracy is when two wolves and a lamb are voting on what to eat. Right. <laughs> yeah. A Republican is when the lamb can contest the vote. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Troy, you guys? Um, well, you know, we, we, when we talked about initially bringing you here, it was because today is a southern holiday because we didn't have this up north um 19th of june but they um it, it's called juneteenth thank you eric eric remind me of that um and it is now considered a national holiday and i can't figure out why in the world it's a national holiday when it had to do with it, just a it, it, maybe you ought to explain what june and, and june so but, and actually i'm going to have him dig into all yeah. of that can you just lay out the whole Juneteenth and, and why it's a national holiday? Because I don't appreciate any of that. But. Well, I, I feel about <laughs> Juneteenth the way I feel about Black History Month. Come on. Not much. <laughs> um, look, Juneteenth is all about the Emancipation Proclamation that was uh, issued by, by Lincoln. Uh, and here in Texas, a general read the Emancipation Proclamation uh, and then freed the slaves in Texas. So it all originated out here in Texas. And by the way, the first president to suggest that it should be a federal holiday was Donald Trump. Biden signed it, but Donald Trump proposed it. And that's what it's all about. Um, my question is this. It's been a national holiday now for four years, since 2021. Are black people better off now that we have a Juneteenth? Come on, no. Yeah. I think they're waiting on their reparations. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, rep reparations is the extraction of money from people who are never slave owners to be given to people who were never slaves. I'm in California, it wasn't even a slave state. And we have a reparation panel that's been set up by the governor. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the biggest problem facing the black community is not a need for a Black History Month or a need for a Juneteenth. Uh, black people, by the way, have higher self-esteem based on self-esteem tests than white people do and much higher than Asian Americans do. Black girls feel better about their bodies than, than white girls do, even though black girls are more likely to be obese than white girls are. So down the line, black boys, black girls, black teens feel more confident about themselves uh, than white people do. So if the idea is to give blacks greater self-esteem, mission accomplished. The real problem facing the black community by far is the large number of children who enter the world without a father in the home married to the mother. Come on. That's right. Nothing else is even close. I know that's ideal. I know people get divorced. I'm just saying the ideal is a father in the home married to the mother. Back in 1965, 25% of black kids entered the world without a father in the home married to the mother. Now that number is 70%. Wait. When was it 25%? 1965. And it's how much now? 70% now. Yeah. And I'll talk about why in just a second. Now 25% of white kids enter the world without a father in the home married to the mother, which was 8% back in 65. What happened in 1965? Lyndon Johnson launched a so-called war on poverty. And I believe, although a lot of people would disagree with me, I believe he did it with the best of intentions. Since then, we have spent over $22 trillion on poverty programs. 
What we have done is to incentivize women to marry the government and incentivize men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. It is the number one social problem in America by far. Yeah, amen. And the numbers are clear. Even Barack Obama once cited them. If you're raised without a father, you're five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. Wow. Wow. And Obama's first book was called Dreams from My Father, all about what? Not having a father in his life and about the pain that he felt. You know, you think about the, some of the most prominent so-called black leaders in America, Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan's mother was estranged from her husband, had a boyfriend, took back up with the husband briefly, got pregnant with Louis, and tried to abort him with a coat hanger. Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton had a nice middle-class life, Father ran away with another woman. Down to the hood he went. I mentioned Barack Obama. Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson was raised in South Carolina. Uh, and in those days, it was rare for a black kid, particularly in the South, to be raised without a mother and a father in the home. Jackson's mother was a teenage mother who was impregnated by the married man who lived next door. Mm. And when Jackson grew up, he was taunted. Jesse ain't got no daddy. Jesse ain't got no daddy. So Obama, Jackson, a Farrakhan, uh, and... Um, Obama, thank you, all grew up without fathers, yet what do they talk about? Racism, racism, racism. When they know from their own experience what troubled them the most, what hurt them the most was not having a father in the home. They ought to be talking about it, but they're not. Yeah. And if you talk about it and you're black, you'll be called, as I was called by the LA Times, the black face of white supremacy. <laughs> Don't laugh, sir, I worked hard for that title. <laughs> and if you're white, they'll call you uh, either uh, racist or they will accuse you of not appreciating the hard job that a lot of single... Uh, black women have done raising boys and girls on their own. But it is the number one problem facing America, and the fact that we're not talking about it is a real problem. There's a, there's a columnist named Nicholas Kristof. He writes for the New York Times, which I read so you don't have to. He's a longtime <laughs> left-wing columnist, and after I began talking about this, this is about six months ago, he wrote a long column and chastised, quote, fellow liberals for ignoring this problem and said, we need to address this problem. By the way, he wrote a column a few days ago where he talked about what's happened to LA, New York, Chicago, and he said, what have we liberals done to these cities? So even people like that are beginning to realize that these left-wing policies have consequences and they are wholly bad. Wow. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, a good friend of ours, uh, the family used to go to this church and then he became the president and CEO of Lowe's Home Improvement, Marvin Ellison. and. Uh, an article just came out. Uh, Marvin's the guy, I don't know if Troy told you, my wife uh, been battling cancer. They gave her, they said, go home and die. Marvin called me and said, I got a friend in LA and, and saved her life. She's alive today because of that. An article just came out today that uh, on Marvin, here's an African-American man. He raised as a, his family were sharecroppers. He started his first job at $4.25 an hour, and today he is one of the most successful men in America, Fortune 500 leader, head of a uh, brilliant man. And he, uh, I've asked him, I said, how did you go from dirt floors, no running water, daddy was a sharecropper, and to one of the most successful businessmen in the world, in America, and he says, well, number one is the Lord. Number two, his mom and dad raised him, as, them and his sisters as a family. I know the whole family. And that, that is such a testament of the need of the family structure. Why, and I know the answer, but I want you to, you to give us your opinion. Why is the Democratic Party, why is the the devil fighting so hard of uh, the family structure. I mean, we've got world wars around us and we've got the Democratic Party fighting about letting a, a, a man who thinks he's a woman use a woman's bathroom. It, it's just, Larry, to me it's insanity we're dealing with these things, but there's gotta be a strategy they have. They've convinced themselves that uh a man and a woman married to each other are unnecessary. Uh, look at Black Lives Matter, which is embraced by the majority of blacks. Barack Obama embraced it. On their website, until they were criticized and took it down, on their website they attacked the nuclear intact family. 
said it was uh, artificial. On their website, uh, these are people that are trained Marxists. They said it, not me. The founders of Black Lives yeah. Matter are self-described trained Marxists. Yeah. Marx yeah. did not believe in God. In fact, he wanted to dethrone God. He was a um, communist and, by definition, opposed capitalism yeah. uh, and free markets. So every single thing that made black people continue to go forward after slavery in the face of horrific racism are now under attack by the left. Black people after slavery continued moving forward. 1940, Larry, 87% of blacks live below the poverty line. 20 years later, 1960, that number had fallen to 47%. That's a 40-point drop in 20 years. That is the greatest 20-year period of economic growth in the history of America for black people. Wow. Why? Because it was rare for a black kid to be raised without a mother and a father in the home, a belief in Judeo-Christian values, a strong belief in entrepreneurship, and a strong belief in American values, even if those values were not being properly applied to America. All of those things are now under attack by the left, every single one of them. Now, Larry, I want to also say this about uh, what you just now said about the importance of a mother and a father in the, in, the, in the home. That said, it is not a death sentence. My father never knew his biological father. My father and I did not get along. My, I have two brothers. None of us liked my father. We thought he was too harsh, thought he spanked us too hard, thought he whipped us too hard. He had a belt, and he would take the belt out and beat the crap out of us. Your and, dad knew my dad. <laughs> and I did not understand why he seemed to be so triggered all the time. And even worse, he would get mad at something, and then you do that same something, and he wouldn't get mad at us. You couldn't figure out what to do. So we disliked him intensely. Um, my father, at the age, I'm now 10 years old, started a small cafe. So I had to work for the SOB. <laughs> so I'm working. When I say cafe, I should say diner because you could. It's just a little box. The grill's right there. El, was People it Elder around, Snacks? El, Elder Snack Bar. Yeah. Taste. Yeah. Uh, taste the difference. Elder Snack Bar. Taste the difference. I don't <laughs> know who came up with that slogan. Fifteen seats, and so you could hear and see everything. And my dad would yell at me. Now I'm 15 years old, and it's getting a little embarrassed to have him yell at me like that. Now I was afraid of my father, so I told myself the next time he yelled at me, I'm going to walk out. He yelled at me, and I was too afraid to walk out. He yelled at me again. I didn't walk out. He yelled at me again, and this time I walked out. First time anybody in my family ever defied my father. My father came home that night. By the way, the waitress had called in sick, so I had left my dad during rush hour with a restaurant full of people. Not too surprisingly, he was not amused. <laughs> he came home. I'm laying on my bed. He said, why did you leave? And for the first time in my life, I spoke back to my father. And I said, Dad... I'm sick and tired of the way you speak to me, and I'm not putting up with it anymore. My dad paid me $10 a day plus tips. He balled at the $10 he owed me for that day. He threw it at me, walked out of my bedroom, and Larry and Troy, we did not have a conversation for 10 years. Wow. Now, we had a little house. It wasn't like I could be in my part of the house, and he's his part of the house. I knew it was ours, so I just made sure he and I were not in the same room. We did not have a conversation wow. for 10 years. And when I say conversation, I mean we did not say, is it going to rain? How about those Dodgers? How about the Rams? I didn't talk to the man for 10 years. So I graduate from high school. I go to college in New England. I go to law school in the Midwest. I'm coming home to visit my mom, but I just make sure my dad and I were not in the same room. Yeah. We did not have a conversation for 10 years. Yeah. Now, I graduated from law school. I passed the Ohio bar. I passed the California bar, but I'm living in Cleveland, and I couldn't sleep. And I knew it had to do with my dad. I figured we'd never be friends but I figured I should say something to the man so I could at least sleep. I'm 25 years old. I'm making the equivalent of around 150 k I should be living large. I can't sleep. So I told my secretary to call, I call my clients, cancel my meetings. I'm going to go to L.A. I'll be back in three days. I went to L.A. I didn't tell my mother and father I was coming because I didn't want my dad to prepare. I'm in LAX. I took a cab from LAX to the restaurant. I knew he closed at 2.30. I got in there at 1.30. I had a big bag of luggage. My dad was shocked to see me. I said, Dad, I want to talk to you. He said, should I put your bags in the back? I said, no, Dad, I'm only going to be here for five or ten minutes. I want to tell you something. He said, okay, wait until we close. So I sat on the stool like this, and I said, okay, now, Larry. I had an hour to calm down. Don't tee off on the man. Don't tell him everything he's ever done, every whipping, 
everything he's ever said that offended you. Don't do that. Just do the cliff notes. Five minutes. He'll call you an ungrateful son. You'll call him a, a cruel, nasty father. And maybe when you get back to Cleveland, you'll be able to sleep. So my dad sat down about as close as you are right now. And I teed off on him. And you know how I can go. <laughs> I talk for 20 minutes nonstop. I told him about the time he spanked me in front of my best friend, Carl. The time he spanked me when my cousin Elaine was visiting. The time he did this, everything I could think of, I told him. And after 20 minutes, I was out of ammo. I was done. Every now and then, my dad, while I was talking, would replenish his coffee, but he just took it. He stirred the coffee, he just took it, didn't say a word. Now I'm out of ammo. My dad said, is that it? Is that it? <laughs> you didn't speak to me for 10 years because of that? And I said, yeah. And he said, let me tell you about my father. Now I need to pause here. I knew my dad was an only child because we never got any Christmas presents from anybody. And I met his mom once, so I assumed his father was somewhere, but I didn't know where or who. I didn't care. I never sat down and said, Dad, tell me about your life. I didn't like the man. What did I care? Yeah. So I'm hearing this for the first time at 25 years old. He said, Larry, you know your last name, Elder? I said, yes. He said, that's not my biological father's name. I said, what? Who's your biological father? I don't know. I never met him. You never met your father? No. Who's Elder? Elder was a man in my life the longest, maybe three or four years. He was an alcoholic who physically abused my mother. And when I tried to stop the abuse, he beat the crap out of me. Every now and then he'd work, he'd give her the money, and then come Wednesday he'd want the money to drink. She wouldn't mm -hmm. give it to him, he'd beat the crap out of her. He said my mom was illiterate, had a series of boyfriends, each one more irresponsible than the other, and then my father was cried. Now Larry, my father was so tough, I didn't think he was capable of crying. Wow. So here I am sitting here watching my father cry, and I didn't know what to say. Yeah. And he said, I came home at the age of 13, this is Athens, Georgia, and I started quarreling with my mom's then boyfriend, he didn't even remember his name. Mom sided with the boyfriend and threw my father out of the house, never to return. Now for the next eight hours, my dad and I sat on these two stools, getting up only occasionally to, to relieve ourselves. We talked for eight hours, and he walked me through his life, left home at 13, Jim Crow South, Athens, Georgia, at the beginning of the Great Depression. He cleaned up trash. He, he cleaned up barns. He uh, was a shoeshine boy, hotel valet. Ultimately became a Pullman porter for the trains. They were the largest private employer of blacks in those days. Mm. So this little black boy who had never been out of Georgia goes all over the country to this place called California, a city called Los Angeles. And my dad said you could walk through the front door of a restaurant and get served? Maybe someday I relocate to Los Angeles. Pearl Harbor, my dad joined the Marines. Do we have any Marines in the house? I asked him why, and my dad gave two reasons. Anybody who's a Marine knows what I'm gonna say. Two reasons, one, they, they, know where, they go where the action is, and number two, I love the uniforms. So my dad was stationed on Guam, uh, in charge of cooking for the colored soldiers. My dad can look at a cake and tell you what's in it, he's that good. He was a staff sergeant, which meant he was a Marksman and a leader of men. War is over. He goes to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he met and married my mom to get him a job as a cook, short order cook. He goes to three or four restaurants and he's told, We don't hire niggers. My this dad, is after the war. After the war. My dad said, I cook for them. We don't care. We don't hire niggers. Went to the unemployment office. Lady said, You went through the wrong door. My dad goes out and sees colored only, goes to that door to the very same lady who sent him out. She was just letting him know what the rules were. He came home to my mom and he said, this is BS, I'm going to LA where I was before the war, I'll get me a job as a cook and I'll send for you. My dad goes out to LA by himself, Wow. he walks around for a day and a half and he's told time and time again, you don't have any references. My dad said, I need references to make ham and eggs. He even offered to work for free for two weeks for a written reference, they wouldn't do that. Unemployment office this time, just one door, Lady says, I have nothing. My dad said, what time do you open? She says, nine. What time do you close? She said, five. My dad said, I'll be in that chair until you find something. Sat there for a whole day the next day. Came back the next day. She called him up around lunchtime. I have something. I don't know whether you're going to want it. My dad said, of course I'm going to want it. I'm starting a family. What is it? And she said, it's a job cleaning toilets. 
My dad did that for 10 years, Nabisco brand bread, took a second full-time job cleaning toilet at another bread company called Barbara Ann Bread, cooked for a family on the weekend to make additional money because he wanted my mom to be a stay-at-home mom, and went to night school three or four nights a week to get his GED. Wow. The man never slept, which is why he was so grouchy all the time. Yeah. If I don't get five hours, you don't want to be near me. <laughs> this guy would get 45 minutes, an hour here, 40 minutes here, an hour here, 40 minutes here. Not day after week, not week after week, not month after month, but year after year. You do that, you walk into a house with three rambunctious boys as we were. What kind of mood are you going Come to on. be in? Come on. And as my dad is telling me this, the man is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and I'm getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And my dad said, you know, and then, you know, when I was married before, I said, whoa. You were married before mom? He said, yes. I thought you were going to say six months, nine months. I said, how long? He said, seven years. Wait, my mom and my dad were married 56 years. You were married to somebody else for seven years? Yes. What happened? She cheated on me. She couldn't have kids. And then the other time I was married, <laughs> got married at 18. The woman, teenager, her parents found out my dad was an eighth grade dropout, marched her down to the courthouse, annulled the marriage. So, Dad, first marriage is annulled. Second marriage, woman cheats on you. Why in the world do you get married again? He said, Larry, because I wanted you. Wow. Wow. Now, I'm crying. <laughs> and so, after eight hours, oh my God. I'm crying, and I said, Dad, please, sir, you're tearing up? <laughs> There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> and um, you're making me cry. And I said, Dad, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And my dad said, there's nothing to forgive you just didn't know. Just follow the advice I've always given you and your brothers. Hard work wins. Come on. You get out of life what you put into it. That's right. That's right. Larry, you cannot control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. Wow. And before good. you moan or groan about what someone did to you or said to you, go to the nearest mirror, look at it, and ask yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, he said this, no matter how hard you work, how good you are, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen to you. How you deal with those bad things will tell your mother and me if we raised a man. My dad and I were the best of friends for the next 35 years. By the way, I wrote a book about this eight-hour conversation called Dear Father, Dear Son, Two Lives, Eight Hours. The paperback is called A Lot Like Me. It's on uh, Amazon. It's by far the most meaningful thing I've ever written. If you look at the reviews, there's over 500 reviews. People say, it changed my life. It made me reach out to my father. It made me a better father. It made me a better parent. It's by far the most important thing I've ever written. Wow. Give us the name again. Dear Father, Dear Son, Two Lives, Eight Hours is a hardback, which is more expensive. The paperback is cheaper. It's called A Lot Like Me. Same book, different title. You know, when you were saying this, I actually was thinking, you ought to write a book on this. And that's, that's an amazing story and a, an amazing life lesson for us to learn. Um, to turn it a little bit, uh, give us your opinion on, a few years back I had a privilege of speaking at the UN and I saw a display of uh, the history of Islam and it showed the end, Islam ruling the world. This was in the UN. There was no other displays, just, it was, like, it was like 50 feet long. Here's where Islam started. Their goal is to rule the world. Uh, give us your opinion. Should we, as the United States of America, be a part of the UN? Um, what's the end game of the UN? Because it seems like a disaster to me. I'm completely indifferent. Um, I don't see why we need one. Uh, I guess it's okay to be somewhere where you can talk, but it's just a big bureaucracy, nothing gets done. Um, I think it's pretty pointless. We're the biggest contributor, uh, and um, they vote against us overwhelmingly. Yeah. You know, I once asked a, a scholar of Islam, is Islam compatible with a republic like America? You know what he said? I'm not sure. And this is a scholar. The end game of Islam is world conquest. They will tell you that. Yeah. Uh, is, if you look at the Quran, you have three choices. 
Uh, you can convert, you can pay a tax as a second class citizen, or you can be killed. Pick one. Yeah. Um, there's no other religion like that. Um, Winston Churchill wrote negatively about Islam and said it was a malevolent force. Um, and the good news is of the 1.5 or so uh, Muslims in the world, only a certain percentage of them are, are interested in, in jihad, violent jihad. But just take 10% of 1.5 million, that's a boatload of people. It's a, it's uh, this is quite dangerous. And yeah. Islam has changed the face of Europe, it's changed the face of France, it's changing uh, Sweden, uh, it's changing um, Europe. Yeah. Uh, I think parts of Europe are, are done for. Um, and I think that the idea that um, we're importing a whole bunch of people from the Middle East who don't support our values, who are not truly people that believe in a, in a, in a Judeo-Christian based republic is a huge, huge problem. And um, that we're doing it without even thinking it through to me is very scary. We, um, a couple months ago, we did uh, from Auschwitz to Birkenau, it's called the March of the Living. And uh, I was asked by uh, the chief rabbi of Israel to walk with him, a Christian and a Jew walking together. And something was that was just so wonderfully shocking is when we got to Birkenau where the gas chambers were, where the ovens were, um, I was introduced to about 50 young Muslim Palestinian youth that were there standing up for Israel. Like I said, I've been to Israel, this will be my 45th time. Uh, I have many Christian friends, Jewish friends, Muslim friends there that get along. But like you said, there's a lot of uh, Islam that is calling for jihad. We saw this happening in our universities since October 7th, where students have been trained by professors coming in from other countries, teaching not only to the, the hate Jews, but to hate America. What's your, what, how do we handle what's happening to our young people in our universities? Again, a lot of this is just flat out ignorance uh, we just have to tell, tell the truth. Uh, you mentioned how many times you've been to uh, Israel. I had my 21st birthday in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. in the Eternal City. And at the time, I had this massive afro. You want to have a good time, pull out your phone and uh, type in Larry Elder afro, afro and hit image. <laughs> and you'll get either me or him. I had some serious, <laughs> some serious, serious kink. <laughs> so I'm walking through the old city, Larry, and these Palestinian kids are just fascinated by me. This is 1973. And I, I'm walking, I turn around, like five little kids are following me. So I walk a little further, I turn around, there's 10 of them. I walk a little further, about 25 Palestinian kids are following me. So I stopped. And they surrounded me, and I had a press conference. One of them could speak English pretty well. They asked me three things. The first one was, do you know Muhammad Ali? You know Muhammad Ali. Yeah. I, I said, personally? They said, yes. I said, no. And about five of them walked away. <laughs> and then they asked me, did I know Angela Davis, the communist? And I said, personally? They said, yes. I said, no. Another 10 walked away. <laughs> and finally, they asked me this. Do you know karate, the martial art? And I said, no. Because if you walk around the old city, there are all these posters of, of American movies about martial arts there and the rest of them walked away. Now, I tell that story, and most of the time, people would laugh. It was funny before 9-11. Yeah. Now it's not, yeah. because now I realize why they asked me these questions. They didn't know about Martin Luther King, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, yeah. the Constitution. What they knew about was Muhammad Ali, because he said F you to Christianity and became a Muslim. Angela Davis, because basically she attacked, a, right. uh, tried, to, tried to stage essentially an insurrection against America. She was a communist and karate because of the movies. They knew nothing at all about America. No, no. So they're taught from the very beginning that America is the big Satan, Israel the little Satan. They know nothing at all about America whatsoever. Right. And that's why they asked me those questions. Yeah. And so much of the world has this image of America that's been put down their throats through the poison of their academia, through all these uh, mullahs who are teaching this kind of hatred. You know, again, the Jews are referred to in the Quran as uh, uh, monkeys and pigs. Uh, and uh, there's no question that Hamas 
on its charter called for not just the destruction of Israel, but the destruction of Jews anywhere and right. everywhere. Right. And the head of Hezbollah said he hopes Jews assemble all in Israel so they can kill them all in one, one right. fell swoop. Right. This is what we're up against. Yeah. They publicly have said this. Yeah. I love the fact that you're on the education topic now because one of the things I've supported you on for a long time is your political action committee that deals with school choice. And I just want you to share with those that are viewing online and those that are here why that is near and dear to your heart. Well, school choice is not a panacea, but it means the money follows the child rather than the other way around. And where there have been real school choice programs, where they haven't had the regulations, uh, haven't had the restrictions that have been imposed upon them by public schools, graduation rates have improved, test scores have improved, parental satisfaction has improved. There are 13 public high schools in the city of Baltimore, all located in the inner city. Zero percent of the kids can do math at grade level. And in Baltimore, the county superintendent of schools is black, the city superintendent of schools is black, the mayor is black, so you can't blame this on the white man or Republicans. Chicago, there were 52 government schools, that's, the prefer, that's my pref preferred term, I prefer to call them government schools and uh, public schools, 52 government schools where 0% of the kids can do math at grade level. Nationwide, 85% of black eighth graders, these are 13-year-old kids, can neither read nor do math at grade level. Half can't do basic reading, which means a substantial percentage of black 13-year-olds in America are functionally illiterate. Wow. Meanwhile, wow. the Democratic Party opposes vigorously school choice because the teachers union opposes them because it threatens their jobs. Meanwhile, the elites, whether Barack Obama or Kamala Harris or Joe Biden or Gavin Newsom have their own kids in private school. There's a very interesting story in Obama's first book, which, by the way, was really quite a quite good book called Dreams from My Father. Uh, there's some argument he didn't write, didn't write it. Uh, Bill Ayers, who was, um, was a terrorist, uh, who uh, is now an educator, uh, there's a lot of speculation that he's, in fact, the one who wrote it. But it's a very well-written book and a very interesting book. Obama was offered a book deal when he became the first person to be on the Harvard Law Review, first black person to be on the Harvard Law Review. So at the age of 20-something, 20 28 years old, he wrote, got a, a book deal to do the book. It didn't sell until he became president, then it sold. But there's a scene in the book where Obama is scouting around trying to decide what church to belong to. By the way, Obama was born a Muslim. And according to the Islamic religion, once a Muslim, always a Muslim. Right. I'd be interested in knowing, when did he convert to Christianity? Where's that documentary? But I digress. So he's in, so he's in Chicago trying to figure out what church to join. He decided to interview with Reverend Jeremiah Wright because it was the most well-connected church. He arrives there early and he starts talking with a church worker, and she's a single mom, black woman, and she told Obama that her son wanted to be in the marching band. And her son's urban high school had no marching band. She scouted around and found a suburban high school, predominantly white, that had not only a marching band, but would give him a free uniform. Mm. So she's thinking about moving to the suburbs, and Reverend Wright was trying to talk her out of it. She told this to Obama. Keep in mind, she's telling this to a biracial kid whose mother was living in Indonesia, sent him back to live with his white grandparents so he, so he could go to Punahou, the finest prep school in Hawaii. So his mother did for him what this mother's trying to do for her son. Right. So Jeremiah Wright comes, Obama meets him, and raises this issue. And Reverend, Reverend Wright said, that's right, if that boy moved to the suburbs, he would not know who he is. And instead of Obama saying, are you smoking something? My mother did this for me. This one wants to do that for her son, wow. and you're telling him that it's more important for him to be around black people so he knows he's black than to get a better education? I'm not joining the church. What did Obama do? Join the church. That tells you virtually everything you need to know about Barack Obama. Wow. Wow. That's, that's deep. That is. I bring the depth. Yes, yeah. you do. Yes. Always. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're the sage from South Central. There you go. <laughs> um, the Prince of Pico Union, the czar of common sense. There Don you go. Lorenzo, <laughs> Don Lorenzo. You know, you talked about the Democrats always throwing out the, this is racist and that's racist. 
you know, one of the, there's some things that I believe are racist in America. And I believe you would agree with the things that I believe that are racist in America. And the number one thing I believe is racist and the only thing that I, de that I deem to be a system of racism is the Democratic Party. That's number one. The number two, and I, I want you to kind of give me some feedback. I, I, I'm, I'm going to run through the, my top three and then just kind of fill me out and, and tell me where you stand on these things. My number two would be that abortion is racist. That's, that was my next question. That's my number two. Because if you notice, they put all the abortion clinics in the minority areas, whether it's Latinos. Or, and, and even what I've noticed is even if you go into a, a white community, where there are trailer parks and they're impoverished, they even have, they, they put two or three abortion clinics there for them because they consider them the weeds of society. Number three, what I consider to be racist is the public or government education system. So what are your views on those racists? Check, check, check. <laughs> the Democratic Party, let's, let's just look at the history. It is a party of slavery, the party of the Confederacy. Wow the party of Jim Crow. Democrats founded the KKK. The KKK used to be referred to as the terror. Wait, 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 wait. Say that again. Democrats founded the KKK. Yes, they did. I didn't say the Democratic Party, but the people that founded the KKK were Democrats. Yes. Really? And the yes. Democrat and, and the KKK used to be known as the terror wing of the Democrat Party. No question about it. A Robert Byrd was a Kegel in the KKK. A Kegel is a recruiter. He was a senior executive with the KKK. Um, so the party of slavery, of Jim Crow, of the Confederacy, the party that founded the KKK, the party of destroying the nuclear intact family with the welfare state, and the party that is governing our K-12 urban American schools. Wow. What else have you done wow. for me lately? <laughs> and regarding uh, abortion, what you said about abortion, well, uh, Planned Parenthood, the founder of what became Planned Parenthood was Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was a eugenist uh, who believed that certain people just shouldn't live. And she gave a speech before the women's auxiliary of the KKK. Who does that? And uh, wait, we wait, wait, wait. Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger. Wait, gave you got to educate this white Mar boy a little Mar bit more Mar here. Margaret Sanger gave a speech before the women's auxiliary of the KKK. You, you know what I'm talking about. There's a picture of her giving the speech. Wow. So. Um, wow. I have that picture. Yeah, she sure did. Wow. I and about, and, and, and about a third a of abortions show. are performed on, on black females. I bought that picture at a gun show when I bought my KKK robe. I thought it was so cool to be a black guy owning a Klan robe. And so I found one at a gun show and I had to have it. Listen, I let you wear that shirt to church, but don't, <laughs> don't, wear, the, don't wear the robe. Don't wear the robe. Because there's some Jews around here we'd get nervous too. <laughs> when I was running for, uh, for governor, uh, you guys passed the fetal heart bill. And so, of course, I was asked about abortion because we're talking about a blue, sure. blue, blue state, California. And um, I said, I'm pro-life. And they talk about, well, you believe in exception for rape and for incest. I said, no, I don't. I said, an innocent life is an innocent life, no matter how, how conceived. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, abortion for the life of the mother, Catholic Church believes that. Um, and I said, let me ask you something. Ask Gavin Newsom. At what point does he believe a pregnancy has gone so far that to terminate the unborn child would be homicide? <laughs> Nobody ever asked him. Whenever that question is put to a Democrat, they dance around it, dance around yeah. it. Kamala Harris was on CBS, and uh, Margaret Brenner, their anchor, asked her, at what point do you think an abortion has gone so far as to constitute murder? And she said, well, uh, I believe that we ought to reinstitute the protections of Roe v. Wade. That's not what I asked you. Ask the question again. She answered it the same way. Ask again, answered it the same way. The only person that definitively answered it was RFK Jr. And he said, not my call. And the interviewer was Sage Steele. She said, including full term? He said, yes, full term. At least he was honest. He got hammered and then started backing away from it. And I, whenever I've seen people say this business about it's up to a woman and her doctor, then you believe that Dr. Kermit Gosnell should be set free. And they go, who's Kermit Gosnell? You know who he is, the Philadelphia abortion doctor 
who performed late, I mean, late-term abortions. One time he even said, I aborted somebody who was so old he could have walked to the bus stop. He is behind bars as we speak. Wow. So the logical extension of what you just now said is up to a woman and her doctor because all these women gave consent is that this man has been persecuted and should be set free. You want to go that far? They don't want to go that far. So the answer is they do want limits. They just don't want to say what they are because they're afraid they're going to lose support. So they call us extremists. They're the extremists. Yeah. Come on. Come on. That's it. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. So with all that's happening in America, there's a lot of talk about, and I'm, and I'm, a, I'm a part of this organization, um, it's something, it's constitutional, it's called an Article 5 Convention of States. Where do you stand on an Article 5 Convention of States, especially because we're talking about getting, having term limits. We're talking about reining in executive powers. We're talking about having um, basically fiscal responsibility, not just tax and spend, but actually having a plan and just not spending more money than we make like we have to do in our households. We don't get the opportunity to spend more money than we make. Right. So where do you stand on that and why? I, I support it. I think about 19 states have now signed on to it. Is that what it is? And it takes around 36 states, I think, to, in order to uh, have a convention. 34 to have a convention, 38 to ratify. Okay. Um, and the primary reason I want it is for fiscal restraint. When I was running for president, I argued that we need to have an amendment to the Constitution to fix spending to a certain percentage of the GDP uh, with possible exceptions for war and for natural disaster. Otherwise, both parties spend, government gets bigger and bigger. Why? Because much of the spending is on automatic pilot. Medicare... Social Security, Medicaid, and now Obamacare. Uh, and they need to be reformed and dramatically. And the only way you're going to make politicians reform it is to force them to do so because you cannot win elections by telling people you're going to take things away from them. You do that, you'll be accused of not caring about the sick, the poor, the elderly, and you will lose elections. The only way to do this is for politicians to say, well, I had to cut down this, I had to do this, I had to reform this, otherwise I would have been in violation of the law. The devil made me do it. That's the only way it's going to be able to happen. Let me say something about term limits, though. People think term limits somehow are going to make things better. I'm in California. We've had them for 30 years. A million people have left California in three years. Our schools are near the bottom. Highest income tax in the country. We have the highest, largest number of homeless people in the country. We have the highest unemployment rate in the country. We have the lowest, lowest job growth rate in the country. All happen under term limits. I believe in term limits. For voters, you vote Democrat two or three times, you lose your right, right. to vote. <laughs> Come on now. I love it. I haven't gotten a lot of support for that, but that's what I believe. No, I mean, it, it doesn't do any good if you're going to vote the same way. You still vote left-wing, tax bin, regulate people. Okay, he's only there for four years. Bring somebody in for four years. Same policy, same philosophy. You haven't done anything. It's just musical chairs. Yeah, that's good. How do you, how do you change... You know, I, w we were talking about this when you first came in. I saw on Fox right when I was getting ready to come to church tonight. And the poll that they showed showed Biden ahead uh, in the polls. Biden at 50%, Trump at 49%. And Troy explained, you can't trust the polls. But how can it be, looking at our country, how can it look... Um, from our foreign policy to our open borders to uh, we just had a, an illegal uh, murder, a mother of five. We had another illegal rape, a 13-year-old child. We have 8 to 13 million illegals that we know of in the country. Uh, Washington State is trying to pass where they don't have any police force anymore, so they're going to allow illegals to be the police force. Uh, Illinois, Illinois said that six months ago. Um, how in the w world can anybody be voting? Uh, you know, my wife, uh, uh, I went shopping the other day and brought home the groceries, and she was looking at the cost of hamburger buns were $5. She said they w used to be 99 cents. How can anybody be voting for Democrat? And the answer I've gotten is a lot of people just vote out of habit. How do we change that habit? I think it's, it's, it's worse than that. They don't know how bad it is because of the sources of their news. I watch Fox, I watch Newsmax, but I also make sure I watch CNN and MSNBC, if only to find out what they're talking about. Yeah. 
There's a guy on Fox named Bill Malusian. Been on the borders now for a couple of years. He does these amazing stories about these hordes of people coming up to our country. And then I cut on CNN. Nothing. Yeah. Cut on MSNBC. Nothing. It was only when governors like yours and like Florida began putting illegal aliens on buses and sending them to places like New York and Chicago did they start caring about it. Yeah. Yeah. A few years ago, 2.5 million illegal aliens came in in one year. A pollster asked Americans, how many illegal aliens came in that year? The average person said 250,000. They were off by a factor of 10. Now, there's no way you could watch Fox and not know the answer. But you can watch CNN, MSNBC, uh, Google News, Yahoo News, uh, uh, TikTok, and be completely ignorant. Uh, one of my good friends is um, Thomas Sowell. He's a mentor of mine, the great economist. He's still with us, 95 years old, and probably the most studied aspect of economics is the minimum wage. California just enacted a minimum wage of $20 an hour, went into effect April 1st. Minimum wage. Since then, yeah. that's, that's a 25% increase of in what it was before. Since then, 10,000 fast food jobs gone. Yeah. Just since April the 1st. Yeah. And so I said to Tom, we're having dinner. I said, this is the most studied aspect of economics. Almost everybody thinks the minimum wage is wholly bad. It hurts people at the bottom the most, black and brown people with less education more than anybody else. There's a left-wing economist named uh, Paul Krugman who writes for uh, New York Times. Yeah. Even he once opposed the minimum wage and said it killed jobs. He's now done a 180 because of politics. The New York Times, 1987, editorial, ideal minimum wage, 0, 0.00. New York Times, they've done a 180. But overwhelmingly, the studies have shown that they hurt the very people that uh, they purport to help. I said to Tom, how come you guys can't win this argument? He said, Larry, most people haven't heard the argument. Oh, wow. wow. So um, in, in my book, I wrote about the race for governor. It's called uh, As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save a Nation. As you can see, my goals are modest. <laughs> so I'm, um, race is over, and I went to a restaurant on the west side of L.A., and uh, my buddy's about 50, 15 minutes late, so I'm sitting at a table by myself. And then ladies sitting next to me, I think they start feeling sorry for me, and we start talking. And turns out they're 85 years old, Jewish, known each other since the second grade. One of them was celebrating her 85th birthday. And then around 20 minutes into the conversation, one of them stopped and said, wait a minute, I know you. You're that guy that ran for governor. You're that Larry, you're that Larry Elder. Guess who we voted for? I said, you didn't vote for me. She said, how do you know that? I said, well, let's see. We're in the west side of L.A. You're both Jewish. It doesn't take Colombo to put yeah. that together. You didn't vote for me. And they said, you're right, we didn't. I said, let me ask you something. You have kids? Yes. Did you put them in LAUSD? No. Why? Quality is too bad. Uh, what do you think about the fact that a million people left California in the last three years? I have good friends who've left California. What do you think about the way Gavin Newsom shut down the state because of COVID in a more severe way than anybody else did? I have friends who lost their restaurants. By the way, a third of all restaurants in California are now gone forever. Wow. And most of these are the mom and a pop third? ones. A third? Wow. Gone forever. Most of them are the mom and pop ones run by black and brown people. Gone forever. How do you feel about the crime? They both told me that they had friends who had been victimized. How do you feel about homelessness? They both told me that there were homeless encampments near their home. I said, so here we are finishing each other's sentences, and you didn't vote for me. Have you ever had a conversation with a conservative Republican? They looked at each other and they said no. Yeah. I also mentioned in the book I've had some back issues, which is why I take Relief Factor. That wasn't a commercial. <laughs> and a friend of mine gave me a massage therapist he thought would be able to help. So I go, and I'm assuming it's going to be in an office building. I turn down a residential street. I go to a house, knock on the door. Door opens. I get hit in the face with this big plume of marijuana. Not that I would know what that would smell like, Larry. Yeah. I've, just, I've just read books. Yeah, yeah. Movies. You know, movies. And the lady is three or four different shades of hair color. She's got tattoos everywhere, ear piercing everywhere but her eyeballs. We come in, and she's working on my back. She's playing Motown music, which, which is my favorite genre of R&B, of popular music. And virtually every song, I knew the backstory. My Girl is my favorite R&B song. 
I said, oh, my girl. That was written by Smokey Robinson. He wrote it for David Ruffin, the lead singer of The Temptations, who, by the way, OD'd on, on cocaine. Right. Another song came on. That's Marvin Gaye. He wrote an album called What's Going On. Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown, tried to talk him out of writing the album because he wanted to control songwriting, but Marvin Gaye did it anyway, became the best-selling album for Motown. So every single song, I pretty much knew the backstory. And she said, about a half hour into the session, I know who you are. When you called to make the appointment, I knew who you were then. I said, I wasn't going to say anything because I didn't vote for you. But had I known you were this funny and this personable, I would have voted for you. Yeah. I said, yeah. do you know any Republicans? She said, no. I said, news bulletin. We have personalities. We have senses of humor. <laughs> Can you imagine not knowing a Democrat? Yeah. Not possible. Yeah. They don't know any Republicans. Yeah. Never had a conversation with one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the, that's, Larry, that's one of the reasons I'm, I've been asked to come to Jerusalem is to speak to the Jewish uh, leadership because forever the Jewish people have voted Democrat. And, and they're starting to wake up just like I think African Americans are starting to wake up, Latinos are starting to wake up. Uh, and I got nothing against white people, I married one. And, uh, 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 and, and they're saying, you know what? We think a big portion is getting ready to make, make that shift. And so that's why I'm going over there to speak to this, this group. Um, I, want, I want to ask you, when we're talking about this shift that's taking place, um, is, uh, I'll pick on the Republican Party a little bit. I know part of the Republican Party is part of the swamp. That's the problem. Um, how much is foreign finances influencing not just the Democratic Party, but the Republican Party? Money from China, which you talked about TikTok. How much is that as a problem, and how do we answer that? It's a huge problem. Uh, China has given billions of dollars to American universities uh, to um, infiltrate curriculum, yep. uh, to uh, teach people that China is not an adversary when they, when they clearly are. Right. Uh, a lot of money has come in to, from places place like Qatar uh, to American universities. Uh, it's a huge, huge problem. Yeah. Um, look, the, both parties have had a corruption problem. Both parties have had a spending problem which is why we need the convention we talked about uh, to rein in spending. And we need to be honest about what's going on in our country. Uh, we are under assault by China, by North Korea, uh, by, uh, uh, by Iran, uh, by radical Islam. Yep. Uh, and uh, China sending up this fentanyl from the, from the southern border. Uh, we're being invaded from the south. This is, I've never seen the country more in jeopardy. And even Christopher Wray said, uh, there's never been more red flags than right now. I believe the only reason we have not had another 9-11 is because if there is something like that before the election and the perpetrators are people that came into the country under Joe Biden, that would guarantee a landslide victory yeah. for Donald Trump. Yeah. But once the election is over, whether Trump wins or Biden wins, I think at that point it's unleash the hounds. Yeah. And who knows what's going to happen in this country? What about terrorist cells that are already functioning in America? We know they're here. Yeah. Um, I have friends who work for the FBI. They have investigations in all 50 states. And I think we've been very, very lucky if something else hasn't happened. But I also think the reason something hasn't happened is what I said earlier. Yeah. There's a pullback right now yeah. for fear that Donald Trump will be worse. Uh, so I would rather have Joe Biden win, so we're not going to do anything until the election is over. But once the election's over... Katie, bar the door. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Maybe That's about good. Yeah. 10 minutes or so. So we're going to go ahead and do some questions. Okay. Um, Pastor uh, Israel and Pastor Lydia is over here, and then Pastor Israel will be over here. So rules for questions. When you come to the mic um, in the aisle, if you have a question, go to the mic in the aisle. Uh, Pastor Israel and um, Pastor Lydia, Lydia will hold mic? the mic. You Lydia, have, do, you, do you have a mic? Where are the mics at, guys? Okay, there they are. Okay. Um, so all questions must be asked in the form of Excellent. a question. If you have a comment, 
that email address on those signs. You need to email your comments to that email address on those signs at the back of the aisle, and then I'll get those to you. You have one minute to ask your question. If you can't ask your question in one minute, email it. <laughs> That's right. Because we don't have time for comments and lengthy conversation on this. So um, let's start with Pastor Israel. First question, and state your name, what city, and do, are you, do you attend this church? Jeff Morgan, second time visitor from Dallas, Texas. Larry, I actually donated to your campaign. I wanted you up on that stage. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you so done. much. Thank you. The question that I have for you is regarding the issue of fatherlessness. Dr. Ben Carson has come out recently against unilateral no-fault divorce. It's getting more and more traction. The Speaker of the House is against it. It's becoming a bigger, bigger issue. I think the issue of fatherlessness has to be tied with that as well. Church people need to be speaking against that because no-fault divorce is an anti-Christian doctrine, comes in from Bolshevik Russia and from Marxism and everything else. Do you have any comments on that and that relationship to the fatherless issue? Thank you. I think it's done a great deal of damage uh, to the family, no-fault divorce. Um, repealing it, putting back the way it used to be where you have to make an allegation against somebody in order to get a divorce, I'm not sure that's a whole lot better. I just think that this is a moral issue uh, that we ought to abide by our commitments, uh, and that uh, infidelity is a sin, it is, it is a moral sin, and the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Amen. 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 And, you know, if I could, uh, you, you, you said about the church, one of the things when we were in the, at the Capitol and we were ha I was having dinner with Senator Cruz, this brought up, and uh, several leaders, uh, there's about 10 of us, and they said, one of the reasons why America is is going downhill is the leaders in the church are not speaking up. And I agree a thousand percent. It is the churches, the, the pastors of the church, it is our obligation to say, and um, it was Kelly um, Stuckford that, that told me, he said, just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you lose your freedom of speech. I have a right as a pastor even though I, we have the microphone, we have the right to say how we feel. Right. And not only do we have a right, we have an obligation, I believe. And I think too many church leaders are making uh, political financial decisions by not saying anything. It's not the job's church to stay neutral. It's the job's church to be biblical. And uh, I think, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Pastor Lydia. Hi. Hello. Check, check. Test check. Yep, we can hear you. Um, I'm Kelly, first time visitor. Uh, Larry, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. We all admire you and look up to you and appreciate all you do. Thanks for leading. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I have a question about voter fraud that concerns me. You mentioned several things that you say are going to be controlled and limited and stopped come election time. Two things you didn't bring up that I worry about are the results on paper ballots that take days and days and days and days to verify. Uh, the, the signatures on them, and the, so the election drags out for a week or 10 days. And the second thing is, um, what about the um, late night videos we saw of them sending counters, tabulators home right. that sure didn't look very good? So what do we do about those two situations? Well, thank you. The, the ideal, of course, is same day voting, in person, voter ID, paper ballot, and count the ballots that night that day. And that's what we ought to be pushing towards. There is a wonderful video on Rumble, an interview with a guy named John Eastman, who was one of Trump's lawyers. Uh, John Eastman has since been disbarred because of his position on January 6th and on voter fraud. Um, he gave a speech before an organization called the American Freedom Alliance. It's about a 48 minute speech. I urge everybody who believes that there was no widespread voter fraud to watch that speech. John Eastman uh, is a very well-educated man. He was a former dean at a, at a law school in California, professor at the same law school, ran for Congress as a Republican. He's not a flamethrower. He's a very calm, methodical, careful man. And when California moved to disbar him, they said, do you have any evidence of your contention of widespread voter fraud. He gave them 100,000 pages of evidence. Wow. And wow. he still got disbarred. 
Wow. But if you listen to what he said about what happened in Wisconsin, what happened in Michigan, what happened, as you mentioned, the time where they were, had these, these voting ballots. Let me just mention Wisconsin. Generally speaking, around 10 to 15 percent of people living in nursing homes in Wisconsin vote. In the 2020 election, there were nursing homes where close to 100 percent voted, including people that were in what's called the memory wing. There is video, you can go on YouTube and see it yourself, where someone is sitting with his or her loved one, and the loved one has no idea where he or she is. And this loved one voted. And the, uh, and this, and the senior citizen voted. And the loved one said, I have no idea why my uncle, why my father, why my grandfather voted, because he couldn't cast a ballot. 100% voting. Wow. And the Republicans hired the former chief justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court to do an investigation, and he filed a report talking about all of these shenanigans. And Donald Trump lost Wisconsin by, I think it was 10,000 votes. Yeah. So there's no question, in my opinion, uh, that the election was rigged, stolen, shenanigans. Use your fra favorite word. But it was completely, totally unfair. You had the, we talked about this earlier, the collusion nonsense, Russia collusion nonsense, the money that Zuckerberg spent, the 51 former intelligence agencies signing this letter claiming that the laptop had all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. How damaging was that? There was a poll that looked at six or, seven, six or seven swing states. And enough people in those states said, had they known about the Hunter Biden laptop story, they would not have voted for Biden, and Trump would have won. That alone, Trump would have won. Yeah. So. Yeah. And if I could throw something in there also that Troy has, we talk about all the time, is um, in August, um, five or six of his pastors met with President Trump, and he, he encouraged us, get the churches to be a voting place. Yep. And we've done that here, right? We, we're, we're doing that here. And I think we have uh, 300 and something churches so far uh, signed up to allow their lobby to be a place of voting so that we have the correct people standing there watching what's being voted. But a friends of ours told us in DC, they went to vote, pulled out their ID, and they said, no, no, we can't look at your ID. We can't look at your ID. And they said, well, how do you know I'm me? Well, we just trust you. Well, that means I can go down the road. And there, there's a video of, of a, a short little white guy going up to a, 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 a precinct, and he said, my name is Eric Holder. And he was given, he was given <laughs> Eric Holder's ballot. He didn't cast it, which would have been a crime, but he got the ballot. Are you kidding me? Oh, my gosh. Can I tell you another quick story a little bit? Uh, um, this contempt people have for Donald Trump, much of it is based upon things he didn't say, didn't do. Um, there was a poll in August of 2016, this is the, uh, right before the election t of 2016, and the number one reason that people gave who didn't like Trump for, for not liking him, number one reason, what do you think it was? He mocked a disabled reporter. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is I, this is a, maybe a month or two ago, I'm my dentist's office on the fifth floor. I get in the elevator to go down to the first floor, punch number one, and the door opens. I walk out not paying attention, and I almost knocked over this little person. Um, that's the term for them. It's a little person, no more than this tall. And my knee hit her right in the forehead. I said, I'm so sorry. And she said, that's all right, you just didn't see me. I know who you are. You ran for governor. And I don't agree. And so we're going down to the first floor, and I got off the end. I said, can you tell me the number one thing you disagree with me on? She said, Trump. And I said, what about him? And she said, he's an a-hole, except she didn't say a. I said, what makes Donald Trump? Give me the number one reason Donald Trump's an a-hole. And he, she said, he mocked a disabled reporter. I said, that's a lie. The reporter in question is named Serge Kovaleski. What happened is Donald Trump got elected, and he said on 9-11, there were Muslims that were cheering the fall of the towers. And for a day or two, nobody could find any corroboration. So Donald Trump produces a story by a, a reporter, I believe it was with the Washington Post, where he said on 9-11, there were people who observed people dancing on the roof and cheering as the walls fell. So they go to the reporter, and the reporter retreated from the story. He said, well, I didn't see it. I'm reporting other people said it, saw it. I didn't say there were hundreds. I don't know what the number was. So Donald Trump is having a rally. He's talking about it. 
And he goes, and the reporter goes, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember. Okay. Serge Kowaleski has an, a, uh, a disability. He has an atrophied arm that goes like this. He doesn't go like this. He speaks very calmly and a very articulate man. He doesn't go like, even he never said he mocked me. Other people said it. Wow. So now that's become the thing. Donald Trump mocked a disabled reporter. There's a website called Catholics for Trump with three or four videos where Trump goes like this ah! to mock himself, to mock an able-bodied general. Donald Trump is a stand-up comedian. He does that. He wasn't mocking his disability. He was mocking his retreat from the story. And she said, I didn't know that. Yeah. And she said, you know, and also, uh, I, I'm Jewish, and I like Donald Trump's stance on, on Israel. Uh, he moved the, the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I said, not only that, he cut off funding for the PLO because they were, they were giving money for homicide bombers. It's called pay to slay, pay to slay. Uh, he did the Abraham Accords. Um, he has been arguably the best friend Israel ever had. And she said, she said, you know, you're making me think. She said, you're cute. <laughs> and I said, I said, so are you. May I take your picture? She said, yes. I went down, took a selfie. She said, thank you for asking permission to take the picture. I said, what do you mean? She said, most people see me walking down the street and like I'm an exhibit in a, in a zoo and take my picture without permission. I said, well, they're a-holes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Hang on just a second. I'm going to get back to these. Let me let the stream people go, and then we'll get to knock these questions out. Um, stream family, thank you for tuning in again. Thank you, Black Contemporary Television, for, ca for capturing this tonight. And I'm going to have Larry say something to you guys. So uh, Pastor Larry and Larry Elder, neither of you knew that a new network that I'm on is not a new network. It's new for me as a conservative voice. I'm the only conservative voice on entire black contemporary television. And they are streaming this entire wow. deal tonight. Awesome. They've they streamed all of our Wednesday nights this month. Awesome. Um, and so we're making an impact. So if you want to say something, both of you want to say something to that audience that this is their first time meeting you. And Let me you. say something as a pastor. Only 10% of Christians get out and vote. It's not enough to pray for our elections You've got to get out and do something about it. So Donald Trump told us, Larry, it, when we met with him, he said, if, if we could get 20 to 25% of Christians voting, it would be a landslide and there's no way they can steal it. So I just want to say, yeah, we need to pray about these elections, but we need to get out. They didn't just pray about the walls of Jericho going down. They got out and walked around them and did something. So get out and vote. Well, the theme of all my work has been we've got a country to save. Uh, and I've been around a very long time. Uh, since the mid-'80s, I've been on TV or radio or both. I've got a website called LarryElder.com, which we're re redoing. In about a month or two, it'll be up. In the meantime, please follow me on Twitter. I've got a podcast I do once a week. It's at the very top of my Twitter file. You can also get it on YouTube under Larry Elder, We've Got a Country to Save. I mentioned my book about Gavin Newsom and about what they've done to California. It's called We've Got a Country to Save. Uh, my mission to rescue the Golden State and save the nation. And I also have a book about uh, what I said about my dad called Dear Father, Dear Son, Two Lives, Eight Hours, which is a hardback, uh, and A Lot Like Me, which is a paperback. So I've been around a very long time, so please uh, just check me out and enjoy my work, and we've got a country to save. Amen. Awesome. Very well. Very good. Thank you, and thank you, Patriot Mobile, for sponsoring Larry to be here tonight.